Well, firstly, I mean, uh, we have been maintaining for uh, quite some time. In fact, from uh, 2012, our position has been that the Human Rights Council will not deliver. And that if at all, <coughs> the Sri Lankan government, whichever government, would uh, merely want to use the Human Rights Council as a, as a tactic uh, to buy time uh, and to show that they are uh, uh, engaging uh, the international community. Uh, but ultimately, when it comes from a victim's point of view, uh, uh, the Human Rights Council will achieve nothing. So our position has always been since 2012 uh, that if we are to uh, seriously address uh, um, accountability uh, and the sort of uh, heinous crimes uh, uh, that uh, are alleged to have taken place, <coughs> Sri Lanka must be taken before the ICC or at the very least uh, an international ad hoc uh, uh, criminal tribunal must be set up. We believe that that is the way to go. Uh, what is encouraging is that the ICC has uh, recently been giving a fairly broad mandate uh, and interpretation to their mandate uh, in uh, trying to prosecute and investigate uh, countries that uh, would normally not have come within their purview because they have not uh, signatories to the Rome Statute. Um, examples being uh, Myanmar. Uh, uh, the United States uh, in the case of uh, uh, alleged crimes uh, that are to be uh, to have been committed in uh, in Afghanistan uh, so these are very encouraging signs I think uh, uh, you have uh, increasingly uh, and the world going into another uh, Cold War uh, scenario and uh, when you have um, institutions like the uh, uh, Security Council, um, uh, the permanent powers are most likely to uh, use their veto powers also. Uh, so for institutions like the ICC uh, that ought to be independent, uh, rightfully taking a, a broader view on how best to prosecute and maximizing the chances of prosecuting uh, international crimes, I think is very encouraging for uh, the Ulam Tamil uh, people. Uh, our belief is that uh, advocacy at this crucial stage is uh, fundamental and uh, our, orga our organization once uh, after these elections uh, we hope to fare pretty well. Uh, with the mandate of the people we hope to uh, uh, take the issue of uh, uh, international accountability very seriously and, and push it at, as uh, our topmost priority. In the past uh, 10 years uh, since uh, the TNPF uh, was formed outside the TNA, after we came out of the TNA, we have tried several times uh, but failed to engage with the, uh, uh, with the Muslim uh, community. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, Muslim political leadership uh, uh, chose to uh, not engage with us deliberately uh, because uh, they wanted to um, pursue close relations with the TNA. So as a result, we have not been successful in uh, engaging at the political level. Even at the social level, uh, you see ultimately since uh, we are not elected and we were not um, um, uh, endorsed by our own people, <coughs> the engagement that we attempted uh, was not uh, far-reaching. I think the only time that uh, there was some serious um, 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 you know, uh, engagement or at least uh, initial engagement was during the uh, Aloha Tamil uh, campaign that we uh, did under the TPC, the Tamil People's Council. We had already uh, had a massive rally in uh, Jaffna and we were planning it in Batiklo uh, uh, in um, February uh, 2017. So in that context, since we had shown our, our strength in mobilizing the Tamil public opinion in Jaffna, uh, there, was a, there was a decent engagement in, uh, in the East, particularly in Batiklo. But that too, unfortunately, after uh, Lahadamal didn't uh, materialize into something more institutionalized. 
But uh, once again, I mean, after these uh, elections, we hope to engage the Muslim leadership both at the political and at the uh, civil society level uh, 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 as much as possible. Our position has always been that uh, the problem with uh, this island is that there is a singular Buddhist nationalist agenda uh, which is mutually exclusive. So uh, initially it was the uh, Ulam Tamil nation that was uh, the threat. Uh, the Singapore Buddhist nationalist agenda now feels that they have uh, broken the back of the Ulam Tamil nation uh, after Mulli Waikal and uh, they believe that uh, the, the, uh, uh, the new target now is the Muslims and uh, they have been doing that uh, for the last 10 years. <clears throat> so we have always told the Muslims that uh, uh, this is a common problem uh, and that um, uh, it is imperative that uh, both the Tamils and the Muslims uh, take up a common position uh, when it comes to the state. Uh, what is at uh, what what is at stake uh, is the very existence of our identity. Uh, whether we want to pursue a common identity as Tamil-speaking people, or whether we want to pursue uh, distinct identities and Tamil and Muslim, that is uh, entirely up to us. But the fact is, whichever identity that we choose uh, to take is under threat because it is uh, uh, essentially seen as something uh, that uh, the singular Buddhist nationalist agenda uh, does not want to have uh, espoused on this island. So uh, I think there is sufficient uh, reason to believe that uh, uh, since the end of uh, uh, the war uh, and particularly because uh, the Muslim community has been targeted right throughout the island uh, in the last 10 years and uh, they feel uh, extremely vulnerable uh, because uh, anti-Muslim sentiments uh, I don't think has ever been this high. Uh, I think they will, uh, they, uh, there is a good chance that the Muslim community might also feel that it is time that they found partners uh, who are willing to cooperate in uh, in uh, espousing their rights, uh, their identity, and uh, and uh, uh, you know seeking common ground. So we believe that the, that gives us opportunities uh, like we've never had in the past, like we've never had had in the past. So in that sense, I think there is some optimism. There is a sense of Islamophobia uh, amongst the um, uh, amongst the Tamils. Um, uh, we realize that uh, we are opposed to that. Uh, when it comes to our party, we are extremely strict that there cannot be any form of uh, Islamophobia. We will not tolerate it. Um, but at the same time, there are issues between the two communities. I mean, the Tamil people face uh, genuine problems, uh, particularly in the East. Uh, like I'm sure the Muslim face uh, genuine uh, uh, issues uh, uh, with regards to the Tamils uh, uh, as well. These issues must be frankly discussed and uh, solutions found. We are not for one moment uh, trying to suggest to the Tamil people that uh, uh, because we need to find common ground that we should not uh, sort out uh, outstanding issues. I think, uh, I think it must be a very fair uh, relationship. It must be an open relationship uh, where we discuss and find solutions. <clears throat> I don't think that uh, that is going to be difficult to uh, succeed in. Uh, particularly because I think for the first time, as I said before, uh, the, the Muslim population uh, would feel uh, that uh, you know, they genuinely need partners. All this while, the Sri Lankan state uh, essentially was wooing them to divide and rule the Tamil-speaking people. Uh, so for the first time, uh, the Muslim uh, leadership, uh, be it uh, political or civil society, is uh, uh, is now a target. So I think, uh, I think, however unfortunate that we'll have to discuss, or we are hoping that it will give us opportunities only under these circumstances. But nonetheless, uh, I truly believe that there are those opportunities, and we will certainly, as a party, uh, after the elections, um, uh, in the event that we. Uh, uh, get uh, uh, a strong mandate. We will uh, we will pursue uh, common positions with the Muslim uh, political leadership and civil society uh, leadership. Well, women leadership in uh, Tamil politics is uh, 
is um, uh, dismal. Uh, and um, we had a uh, we, we had a conference uh, two years ago in 2018 March. Uh, we had done quite a bit of groundwork uh, for almost two months prior to that uh, conference, and we had a very strong turnout from the uh, uh, general public, uh, as well as our own party uh, female leadership, and. We made certain pledges. In fact, those pledges are made public. We made it public. We, if in our office, we have a, a banner uh, that uh, puts down uh, those pledges, so that any member of the public or any member of our party who walks into our office will see that those pledges have been made and they those commitments must be met. Uh, one of the most important parts of that commitment is that uh, by by uh, 10 years time, that is by uh, 2028, uh, our party will uh, uh, hopefully by then guarantee 50% uh, um, membership across uh, our structures uh, for women. Now whilst I believe that initially it is absolutely important to ensure quotas, the, uh, the eventual target is that we don't, within our party, we don't have this distinction of, of um, male and female, that we don't need to think in that way, that we build uh, enough capacity and uh, confidence amongst uh, our women membership uh, that they can stand uh, uh, in their own right uh, and, uh, and thereby compete. Uh, so that's the eventual target. Unfortunately, I mean, last at the last general elections, we had a very good, uh, uh, relatively speaking, obviously, we had a very good uh, uh, women representation in the in the list that we uh, that we fielded. Uh, this year, uh, at these elections, uh, very unfortunately, our target of at least twenty five percent was not even met in Jaffna. We only have twenty percent out of ten candidates. Uh, uh, we only have two uh, female candidates. In the other districts, um, representation is 25%, but still, it should have increased. Um, you know, our ideal target would have been around 30% 30 to 35%. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we are, we are, one thing is that we are encouraged. I think uh, the, mo the most active part of our membership uh, um, are women. Uh, so the, they will take leadership. There are already um, several projects that they have uh, decided that they are going to pursue uh, within this year. Unfortunately, Corona, uh, the Corona lockdown came in between, uh, and those uh, projects could not uh, could not be pursued. Uh, for our, for for our party, we are we are very encouraged because uh, uh, you know I, I think when it comes to leadership and uh, uh, you know going down to the grassroots in uh, in changing opinions creating awareness not only with regards to uh, women's rights but also with regards to our own political uh, question um, our women folk are uh, by far the leaders so I think uh, we believe that uh, there is the will in our party uh, to bring about gender equality, um, you know, and I uh, and obviously we need to have the change happen at home before we can go out into society. Within this, uh, within the next two years, the target uh, of our party structure uh, having a minimum representation of twenty five percent right across. Uh, uh, all tiers uh, will be met. Uh, that is, uh, that is for certain. We are on target for that. Um, well, as far as uplifting the livelihoods of uh, uh, the Tamil population in the uh, northeast, our election manifesto uh, talks of 
uh, two I main targets. One is that when it comes to dealing with the Sri Lankan state, our position is that the Northeast must be declared a, a war-affected zone uh, and thereby creating um, a distinction between the Northeast and the rest of the island. Uh, for over 30 years, <clears throat> the Northeast has been deliberately destroyed through war. Uh, so as a result, uh, we've also had in the in, a, uh, in the uh, most part of that 32 uh, years, uh, we've had uh, economic embargoes uh, in the northeast, uh, so draconian and so um, uh, oppressive uh, that a liter of petrol, uh, when those when these uh, embargoes were on, used to cost something like 1,500 to 2,000 rupees. So th those were the conditions under which uh, the Tamil people had to survive. Uh, basically, uh, it was just a very basic existence. And uh, since the end of the war, uh, the economy of the Tamil people uh, lags behind by a good 30 years. You know, if not for the diaspora and the injection of uh, a significant amount of uh, uh, money to their re relatives, uh, uh, you know, to uh, expect the uh, Tamils of the Northeast to compete with the rest of the island uh, was something that was uh, going to drive them more into debt uh, and into more severe financial crises. And uh, so that is the reality. So with our engagement with the government, uh, we, we hope to um, take up this issue of uh, uh, declaring the Northeast uh, uh, a war-affected uh, zone. Uh, and creating a buffer uh, uh, and give sufficient time for the people of the Northeast to have their economy back uh, to at least some degree uh, before they can uh, uh, compete at, a, uh, at somewhat of a level playing field. Uh, with regards to the second uh, uh, sort of uh, action plan, you know, we've been engaging with the diaspora quite significantly for the last 10 years. Ever since we left the TNA, we've, uh, uh, one of our uh, areas that we've been most successful has been uh, with regards to our diaspora engagement. And what we noticed was that the diaspora is ever ready, has, uh, is ever ready to, uh, to help, uh, you know, in the form of just outright help without expecting anything in return. But also, uh, is prepared to invest. The concerns, of course, is that those investments must be, uh, a, you know, done in a way that uh, they can invest uh, in the way that they like, uh, and not have to uh, uh, be told that uh, their investments can only be done in a particular way. The past experiences with the state uh, getting involved has been that. Uh, uh, through BOI and various other larger uh, uh, project institutions, uh, they've redirected uh, substantial amounts of diaspora funding uh, uh, to areas that uh, the diaspora uh, is not interested in. So wh what our strategy is, is that we, have, we don't want to uh, encourage uh, diaspora members to initially invest at, uh, at the BOI level. But instead, at the small and medium scale industries where uh, their direct investment can be secured, uh, where the sort of red tape that is required is minimal, uh, and where uh, they can find easily partners uh, at the local level, um, and uh, uh, the sort of direct um, empowerment that uh, these projects will uh, provide. Um, uh, is something that is uh, very sort of very real uh, both for the investor as well as uh, obviously for the uh, uh, for the employees so we've also had very encouraging um, discussions with people like for example the Bishop of uh, Jaffna uh, um, uh, Bishop uh, Justin Yanaprasam, in fact, when we went uh, to meet him uh, to get his blessings uh, for our party at these elections, even in the 2018 local government elections when we met him, uh, he uh, did tell us that he himself 
uh, can secure substantial amount of diaspora investment uh, at the both uh, small to medium scale industries um, uh, and that unfortunately there has been no political leadership uh, to take advantage of uh, of his services obviously being a bishop he himself uh, cannot uh, take responsibility for such uh, work uh, but that through his contacts and uh, through his uh, good offices that he could uh, he could uh, bring in substantial amount of investment so there's when we have people such as him uh, when we have uh, diaspora organizations also willing to cooperate uh, uh, you know we see no reason why uh, we can't make a significant uh, contribution uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, economies of uh, every uh, family. <clears throat> we are also aware that, you know, the diaspora is now a good uh, 30, 40 years since they've uh, established themselves in, uh, in uh, mainly uh, European and Western uh, countries. Uh, they are financial burdens, although quite significant, particularly with this corona, but uh, in that 30 40 years they have uh, in every practically every country have established themselves um, remarkably uh, every country that i have been to uh, governments speak very highly of uh, the achievements uh, of the tamil diaspora per capita i think they are uh, uh, they stand at the highest brackets uh, in, uh, um, uh, in 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 the amount of income that they earn so in in every sense i don't see any reason why uh, if there is the will uh, why we can't have a significant amount of uh, uh, investment uh, and at the same time uh, why the local population cannot be empowered As regards to how we will work with the diaspora to achieve these aims, I mean, I think I've already um, uh, touched on uh, a few of the issues, particularly when it comes to uh, economic empowerment uh, in the homeland. But I think, you know, in principle, I think where we probably differ from everyone else is that we have always stated that um, the Tamil nation includes the diaspora. Right, so uh, as far as our, uh, as far as we are concerned, the Tamil Nation citizenship includes the diaspora. It just means that the there is a, a significant uh, part of our citizenship that uh, does not physically uh, live in the homeland. Uh, uh, that means that we need to have structures in place um, where uh, there is a um, where, is, where where we have institutionalized uh, engagement. Uh, both uh, uh, or at, at all levels um, with the homeland uh, so one of the you know one of the structures that we have been mooting since 2010 which is when the TNPF was formed uh, is for the formation of a Tamil National Council and that council essentially would be uh, comprising of uh, uh, elected members uh, in the Tamil homeland, uh, civil society uh, members uh, in the Tamil homeland, and the equivalent in the diaspora. Uh, and uh, that council will essentially, uh, we hope, uh, evolve into a, a counter power center uh, to uh, Colombo. I we believe that that is fundamental uh, if we are to go if we are to create leverage now whilst that in no way being you know uh, people who have to function within Sri Lanka whilst uh, the formation of a Tamil National Council in no way will uh, uh, you know uh, will go in the direction of uh, uh, espousing directly or indirectly the creation of a separate state uh, or will in any way threaten uh, the Sixth Amendment in that sense. Uh, nonetheless, what we do hope to create is a sufficient amount of uh, power within intellectual as well as financial uh, uh, within that uh, Tamil National Council uh, to uh, uh, you know create sufficient um, 
uh, sufficient impact on all matters concerned in the Northeast. So if the biggest threat that we feel uh, to centralization of power uh, in the forthcoming five years, uh, this is the way that we can practically make sure uh, that that centralization of uh, not only political but economic power uh, gets defeated. We need to create our own structures outside that of the state uh, that can counterbalance uh, at every level. So that is a plan that we've in fact been espousing since 2010. Uh, even in 2015 our election manifesto uh, uh, emphasized uh, the need for a Tamil National Council. Uh, this time also our manifesto is very clear on that. Uh, we will do it. I mean, uh, if we get the uh, relevant mandate uh, and if uh, the diaspora is willing to accept that mandate uh, from uh, for us uh, at the grassroots, uh, at, the, at, at the homeland level, then, uh, then I see no reason why we should not be able to achieve uh, that task. But I don't agree with this sixth question. Uh, I mean, the TNPF has uh, been critical of uh, the TNA, obviously. Uh, that's a major part of uh, what our work ought to be. I mean, we have to keep uh, uh, those elected, uh, uh, you know, we have to hold them into account. Um, and the TNA, more than anybody else, uh, really had to do that because we were the party 10 years ago, soon after the war. Uh, that came out and said, uh, look, the TNA is not what it claims to be. And uh, 10 years down the road, I think uh, we have been completely vindicated. Uh, and uh, today, uh, the sort of public response uh, towards us, towards what we say, uh, is just, uh, it's just uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's been a sea change in attitudes. Uh, I think the TNA today is in the position that the TNPF was 10 years ago. Now all this couldn't have happened if we had not uh, exposed uh, the uh, duplicity of the TNA and um, uh, you know what they, well, all their failings. Uh, but at the same time, since 2010, we have also very clearly said what we are all about. We have said that our uh, goal is uh, to have a constitutional change that would recognize the existence of the Tamil nation uh, on this island in uh, in, uh, in a merged northeast Tamil homeland. Uh, that uh, the Tamil nation's distinct sovereignty uh, has to be recognized, and it is on the basis of that uh, Tamil nation and its own distinct sovereignty that a federal arrangement has to be met. So that has been the uh, political. Uh, agenda with regards to finding a political solution. Uh, we have gone beyond mere rhetoric uh, uh, in 2016 where we became part of the Tamil People's Council. The TNPF played a major role, uh, if not the most dominant role within that council to uh, draft uh, a set of pro political proposals uh, that we are committed to even today. I mean our election manifesto specifically mentions the Tamil uh, People's Council's uh, uh, political proposals that we handed over to the uh, task force uh, uh, that was formed uh, by the government to, uh, uh, you know, to understand uh, uh, people's opinions on political reform, um, on constitutional reform. So, so we've gone beyond mere rhetoric when it comes to uh, what uh, political solution we are talking about. It's a very detailed proposal uh, and I think it is unmatched uh, in uh, in Tamil political history with regards to a, uh, a, a political formation coming up with those uh, sort of proposals. It is uh, it, the only proposal that goes beyond I think in, uh, in, uh, uh, in its sort of uh, strength so to speak. Uh, is the LTT's IC, uh, ISGA proposals, but those proposals were in a completely different set of circumstances. That's why I don't like to compare the ISGA with uh, with what we what our party has done uh, with the TPC. The second issue is with regards to your accountability. I mean, 
you know, we have been very, very frank uh, to the point where sometimes we are even criticized of being, uh, uh, you know, spoilers. Uh, but, I mean, you know, we believe in uh, saying what we feel and uh, our, our, our view is that the Human Rights Council is a, is a dead end. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, consistently, uh, you know, uh, we have consistently accused, I'll use the word accused, the sections of the international community for using the Human Rights Council and the Tamil issue uh, purely for geopolitical considerations to put pressure on, uh, on the administration, particularly the Rajapaksa administration. Uh, but actually not be victim-centric in the sense of uh, 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 finding accountability uh, for the victims. So that has been a, a very strong position that we've taken. We still hold that view. Our view is that uh, in Sri Lanka the only way you can have accountability is, by, uh, is through uh, international criminal justice. There can be no local element to it. Uh, I think the last 10 years goes well uh, beyond uh, anybody's, uh, even the slightest doubt, that uh, expecting a mm. domestic angle to anything to do with accountability is, uh, is going to be a dead end. Uh, our view is that, that international criminal accountability has uh, the best way to go about it is uh, through the ICC or the setting up of an international uh, criminal tribunal, ad hoc tribunal on Sri Lanka. I think the ICC we see as a better bet uh, simply because in the last two years you find the ICC itself uh, giving a very broad uh, interpretation to the mandate, uh, to the mandate it has uh, and has uh, found ways and means uh, or is looking at ways and means actively. Uh, to, uh, you know, somehow uh, work around uh, and not get caught uh, into the uh, Security Council um, uh, veto problems that could arise with the change of uh, international politics going into another Cold War sort of era. So all of this is encouraging. I mean, our, our view is that there are other ways also for international accountability. I mean, already certain steps have been taken uh, in the United States, in certain other countries, um, uh, on the basis of universal jurisdiction. I think those can, those can happen. But as a political party, as a political institution, uh, our view is that we will focus on the need for accountability through the ICC uh, or through an international criminal tribunal. Uh, that we're absolutely certain about. The economic angle is something that I've already explained. Uh, we don't have massive uh, plans. We can't possibly have massive plans when we don't have self-government, uh, when we don't have, uh, when, when, when we are not in control of our own destinies uh, in this island. But uh, certainly within the framework of uh, what Sri Lanka is today, which is an ethnocracy, um, which is actively trying to dismantle our economy, uh, to drive us out uh, of physically drive us out of uh, this island and our homeland. Uh, given those circumstances, we have, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, fairly moderate, but uh, what we believe to be uh, workable targets to uplift the economic level uh, levels of our population uh, to such an extent that we will be able to challenge the Sri Lankan state's uh, agenda of driving us out. Uh, you know, obviously the diaspora plays a massive role in that. And uh, for in order to get the diaspora involved at every level and be partners uh, to this project of uh, economic empowerment, I have already mentioned the creation of a Tamil National Council, which we will uh, which we will do the moment uh, these elections are over and that uh, we get a strong mandate uh, and are credible in the eyes of the diaspora to pursue that uh, avenue.